Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio with Joe Stopulis and Father Zach Kautsky is inspiring men to live out their call to holiness every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Courtesy of John Harada, Farm Bureau Financial Services, Construction Professionals, and Global Tech Services and Global Aviation Resources. It's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting today from the Mercy Live Up Studios, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM. Around the globe, streaming online at iowacatholicradio.com and on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Also, you please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. I am Joe Stopulis, along with Father Zach Kautsky, and today we are joined again by a Franciscan friar and author, Dan Horan. Uh, the topic for today's show is the spirituality of Thomas Merton. We had Dan on previously to discuss the, quote, the, the title of the show being Following Christ in the Modern World. And today we're going to explore the world of Thomas Merton and what we can learn from him. Father Zach, would you please open us up in a word of prayer? Absolutely, Joe. Happy Easter. Happy Easter to Happy you. Happy Easter everybody listening as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and we thank you for the gift of your life, the gift of the resurrection. You are our Redeemer. You reconcile us to the Father, and you have conquered death and brought life, eternal life to us. So we ask that in these days of Easter that we would bring the joy of the resurrection, uh, the peace of the resurrection, to those around us uh, in our concrete actions, in our words, and in the way we spend our time. And this we ask, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Father, the topic of today's show is in regards to Thomas Merton and his spirituality yeah. and what we can learn from him. But today's May 1st. Uh, it's the start of the month of May, which means we... The month of... Mary. The month of Mary. So yeah. we are looking to, uh, you know, to the Catholic Church adds extra emphasis this month uh, in, in our reverence to Mary and what we do uh, in, in our devotions to her. And I'd just like to start and have a conversation about Mary in general. So I, she's seen as a large stumbling block to many people coming into the church. We just had uh, the Easter vigil recently. I know why. I mean, why, are people, are, why are people stumbling around Mary? Why do you think that is? Right, and during this month that that uh, is devoted to her, and in a special way, um, you know, May first is the, also the, the feast of Saint Joseph the Worker, so we don't forget him, the spouse of Mary. We look to her in a special way, uh, especially after the resurrection, really, as that model disciple. And we know that during those times, even after the resurrection, that there was a lot of uncertainty and and still a lot of questions. And we, you know, when you read the resurrection stories. You hear about all the just the chaos, you know. Mary Magdalene's running around. Uh, the apostles are running around. They don't know what's going. They think maybe grave robbers came. Uh, so there's a lot of just reaction going on. But Mary's reaction, by faith, is is once again to ponder all these things in her heart, just as she did with the angel uh, at the Annunciation, to ponder these things in her heart, to hold on to these in prayer. And so we look to her as an example. You know, we. We ask her to to pray for us, just as we would any friend or anybody that we respect. We, I hope, would be able to ask our own earthly mother to pray for us. Uh, and so we do the same for Mary, who is the mother of God. And uh, we have uh, the, the beautiful story of the wedding feast at Cana, Christ's first public miracle in his ministry. And uh, she says, do whatever he tells you to do. Do whatever my son tells you to do. So she gives an example of always pointing us toward Jesus. And, you know, I think it's important. I think, again, from a stumbling block standpoint, is that getting caught up in the wording of are we worshiping Mary or are we, you know, we would say we're reverencing her. Right? Yeah, and on, this, honor her and, yeah, or reverence, yeah. And this this month, we just take a, a little extra step in doing that. Yeah. Uh, we take a little bit more aside and put a little more emphasis, understanding that without her, none of this is possible. Right. Still, obviously, putting Jesus first. Uh, Jesus is still the the one we go to. But Mary points us to Jesus. The Rosary is all about pointing us to Jesus. It's not about the worship of Mary. It's about reflecting the life of Jesus, uh, and Mary pointing us to Jesus, who then in turn points us to the Father. So, I think this month, Father, do you have any suggestions for our listeners as far as what they can do to? Get a, a couple of things I say is is of course praying the Rosary. That's maybe a no brainer to 
pray the rosary, but maybe to put up an image in your house, if you have a, a picture of Mary somewhere, maybe to kind of enshrine that in a special place somewhere where you see it, uh, maybe have uh, an image of Mary with some flowers next to it, or just something to call attention to uh, to Our Lady. Of course, there's uh, you can do novenas, you can do uh, different prayers, you can look online um, on the Catholic apps, uh, just to honor her in a special way, and I think too, um, to really have a special intention this month, to think about, you know, is there a certain grace that I'd like to ask her to obtain from her son? Mm-hmm. Uh, she'll always be our prayer warrior, so so really, I think to use this month to, again, it's always about Christ, and so to to uh, ask her for for prayers. Yeah. So we're going to have Dan Horan on next to talk about the spirituality of Thomas Merton. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy Live Up Studios, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM, around the globe, streaming online at iowacatholicradio.com and on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. I am Joe Stopulis, along with Father Zakowski, and today we are joined by Father Dan Haran. Dan is a Franciscan friar of the Holy Name Province. He is a columnist for American Magazine and the author of several books, including the award-winning a book, The Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton. He's a frequent lecturer and retreat director around the United States, Canada, and Europe. And uh, relevant to today's show, uh, he serves on the board of directors of the International Thomas Merton Society. Well, Dan, welcome to the show again. Thanks so much. Good to be with you, Joe and Father Zach. Yeah, well, as soon as we got done with our last interview off the air, we talked, and I said, hey, we, we've we got to have you back on to talk about Thomas Merton again. I think he's such a great figure, especially with uh, you know, the Pope's recent visit to the United States and him kind of circling out Thomas Merton is one of the great heroes of America. And, and, and you've done some, some major writing on him and thought, gosh darn it, we need to have you back on to talk about Thomas Merton. So thank you for jumping back on with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, it's, there's almost nothing I'd rather talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, let, let's start at the top then. How did, how did you become so interested in Thomas Merton? Well, it's interesting. I, I like to say that uh, my interest in Merton began as a hobby that grew out of control. So I started reading him uh, for my own kind of personal prayer life and spiritual development. Uh, I didn't know much about Merton until I went off to college and uh, was introduced to him there. As it happened, where I went to school, St. Bonaventure University, is a place where Merton taught for three semesters. So I guess you could say I was kind of haunted by his ghost. Well, that's good. That's good. Spirit of Merton. Yeah, not too bad. So for, um, our so listeners, over... for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with who Tom, Thomas Merton is, can you give a real quick just bio on him, anything they might need to know? Absolutely. So uh, Merton was born in 1915, so uh, January 31st, as it happened. We would be celebrating his 102nd birthday this year if he were still alive. Uh, born in, um, uh, you know, in France, uh, the son of two parents who were artists. They traveled a lot. He didn't have much of a faith tradition growing up, though. Both of his parents were uh, from nominally Episcopalian backgrounds. Uh, he, his mother died when he was six. His father died just 10 years later. So by the time he was 16, he was effectively an orphan. Mm-hmm. Uh, lived with his mother's family for a while. Uh, you know, was a bright student. Ended up first going to the University of Cambridge and then to Columbia University. I always like to joke he had a good backup school, Columbia University. <laughs> Um, and studied uh, literature there uh, and came across uh, philosophical tradition of medieval Catholics. And for the longest time, he had this real kind of anti-Catholic sort of prejudice. He believed that Catholicism was an, uh, kind of an anti-intellectual tradition, that the Pope speaks and everybody jumps, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and found with uh, his study of medieval philosophy and theology that there's a rich tradition of insight and knowledge and inquiry. And so uh, began then discerning uh, entrance into the Catholic Church. He was baptized and almost immediately started discerning a call to religious life. To make a long story short, uh, he ended up entering the Abbey of Gethsemane. That's a a Trappist monastery outside Louisville, Kentucky, on December 10th, 1941. Uh, And uh, from there became kind of really one of the most uh, famous Catholic spiritual writers of the 20th century. And I can say more about the particulars there. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, you know, he lived as a monk for 27 years, 
died very suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, from an accident uh, while while giving a conference uh, overseas. And uh, and his legacy, his tradition, his writings, his inspiration continues to to live on today. Yeah, I, I think one of the big takeaways for me is some of the parallels between him uh, and St. Augustine. It's just amazing, these two guys who are these huge minds, some of the smartest people and very much of the world, right? I mean, uh, his background prior to discovering that book and his time in before college in college was very much of the world uh, and, and very di- more uh, disdain for the Catholic Church than respect for it. Uh, and so his turning around is just, I, I don't know, I, I, that's what inspires me so much about Thomas Merton is the fact that he, he saw what the world had to offer. And then once he realized that that's not what he wanted, uh, he lived a life as a monk in, in, in peace and wrote, uh, obviously, unbelievable volumes of books uh, and now became one of the, yeah. the greatest thinkers in American history. So, well, Thomas Mern was right. Yeah. Thomas Mern was really uh, uh, influenced by St. Francis of Assisi and that spirituality. Uh, how did he yeah, kind of come across Francis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, just first to that, that earlier point too, about St. Augustine, he's really likened to St. Augustine in many ways and, his first sort of widely acclaimed book, The Seven Story Mountain, which was his spiritual autobiography, was kind of hailed it as a modern confession, yeah. uh, where exactly as you were describing it, he uh, kind of details his own coming to the faith, his own conversion, what his life was like beforehand. Uh, and, and it really is extraordinary. But I would say even more so, and this ties to that question of yours about how he came to know Francis of Assisi and the Franciscan tradition. Uh, is that he shared in common with St. Augustine an intellectual conversion before uh, a more spiritual or, or faith-based conversion, one of a kind of lived reality. And that's because he discovered uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition, the great thinkers Thomas Aquinas, uh, St. Bonaventure, John Duns Scotus. And these great medieval uh, Catholic thinkers were his kind of entree into the practice of Christianity, the practice of faith. Um, and so that, that's another thing they share in common, and it's actually in that experience of, of uh, taking classes at Columbia in medieval philosophy and theology, and then later his own sort of reading and study, particularly while teaching English at St. Bonaventure University and getting to know the Franciscan friars there, that he really came to appreciate and, and love the Franciscan tradition. So the subtitle of your book is A New Look at the Spiritual Inspiration of His Life, Thought, and Writing. So... Could you give us a little bit of background into what, you know, how is this a new look at it? You know, what has been, did you uncover things that weren't known before, or did you shed a different light on it? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I wish we had, this, this program was like six hours You long. can go for six <laughs> hours, and we'll, yeah, cut, we'll, it, we'll cut it into like it up 18 into... different programs. <laughs> yeah, like episode 12. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a year well, um, yeah, so a couple of the things in terms of, of new discoveries. Uh, one is really the depth uh, of his interest in the Franciscan tradition. So one of the things I sort of brushed over when I said, to make a long story short about his conversion um, in his entrance eventually into the Abbey of Gethsemane is that his first kind of encounter with religious life was uh, an exploration of a vocation to the Franciscan friars. In fact, uh, he was initially accepted into and was interested in joining my own province, which is based in New York City. Um, and one of the things that's an, a new contribution in, in my work and that study is the kind of uncovering of the many layers of what was going on in those two years of discernment. How is it that Merton ended up not becoming a Franciscan friar? How did he end up at Bonaventure, uh, St. Bonaventure University? How is it that uh, the Franciscan tradition continued to kind of shape his, his own vocational discernment, uh, which wasn't as well understood and hasn't been for a while. In, in The Seven Story Mountain, Merton tells his own version of this, but it's very quick, very uh, sort of one-dimensional, and, and it leaves out a lot of uh, the additional factors, like what, what else was going on in his life at the time? Uh, what was the role of the relationships uh, of his, his kind of friends and inner circle? How did they impact his own discernment? Uh, what is it that the conversation between uh, Merton and the Friars and Merton and his uh, kind of spiritual mentor, uh, who was a professor at Columbia, you know, what impact did those kinds of discussions have on him? And so um, that very early part of his life uh, needed to be examined a lot more closely. 
Uh, but with regard to some of these other kind of new looks at his spiritual uh, outlook and the spiritual inspiration for his writings, uh, one of the things that Merton is probably best known for, and many of your listeners may uh, be familiar with this already, is the notion of the true self. Uh, Merton writes about uh, our prayer journey, our spiritual exploration being one where ultimately we're seeking God, but also seeking who it is God has created us to be. And that's what he calls the true self. Uh, in contrast, we spend so much time cultivating and, and making and building these false selves or masks or illusory selves, as he calls them. And so uh, one of the interesting things is that Merton's original idea of the true self uh, begins with his study of a medieval Franciscan theologian uh, by the name of John Duns Scotus, who, who talks about what makes a human person a human person. And that becomes the kernel for uh, Merton's own development of the spiritual idea of the true self and the false self. So that's one example, but there's so many ways the, the Franciscan tradition shapes his theological out, outlook too. Like, who is Christ? Uh, you know, why did God become human? What does it mean to be a peacemaker? How do we respond to violence in the world? Uh, what do we do with all these different religions? How do Christians respond to uh, differences in faith and the like? And so Francis of Assisi and, and the tradition that's named after him kind of casts its shadow uh, and helps shape and, and inform and is always present in the way that Merton engages these different topics. You're listening to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. Today we're joined by Dan Horan, and we're discussing the topic of the spirituality of Thomas Merton. And, uh, Father, I want to go back to that uh, it's in Chapter 5 of your book, of course, uh, the book uh, we've talked about, The Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton, uh, your book. This idea, I think, is really important of the true self and getting getting to the heart of our true identity. And uh, there was a, a, a quote you used from Merton, uh, and I'll just kind of paraphrase it quick. But, uh, what we are, our identity is only truly known to God, not to ourselves, not to other men. The greatest terror of that particular judgment is that the moment after our death, we instantly appear before the face of God and learn our identity. Truly, we finally see ourselves as we really are. And so I think that's that's very, very important uh, just for the virtue of hu humility to to not think about how the world views us or if the world respects us or likes us, but really to understand our identity in terms of our love of God and our relationship to God. So I, I think that's such an important point for, for men today. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, especially in our context today where, uh, you have social media, for instance, which of course becomes like the scapegoat for everything that's evil and wrong, right? Oh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a catch all. Just throw it in. Just throw it all. It's a net. Yeah. Just, it's, it's all, everything that's bad is, is Facebook. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, the, one of the challenges there is that we live in a time and in a place where uh, we're constantly aware of how we're being perceived and what we're presenting to the world and thinking about that in, in kind of uh, different ways, ways that have not always been the case. And, uh, and I think that's even more, the, you know, more relevant, as you point out right now, this idea of where do we find our true selves? And one of the things that Merton uh, made clear long before the technological age is uh, this idea that we only find who we actually are by finding God. Th those are inseparable journeys. And, uh, you know, if we, we think we understand who we are, if we are trying to create our own identity, then, then we're missing something. Um, so I think that is really important. I think the other thing that's interesting, too, that Franciscan imprint there uh, it dates even earlier than, than Scotus, who is kind of a later philosopher and theologian, and it goes right back to the heart of Francis of Assisi's own faith and advice to the friars. Um, and Merton was aware of this. There's a, a little-known text, a uh, series of texts called the Admonitions. And in uh, Admonition 19, Francis of Assisi says that who we are before God, that we are and nothing more, or conversely, you know, nothing less. And Merton spends a lot of time in his journals uh, in those early years as he's discerning religious life, reflecting on that. Um, and so I think there you see the kind of uh, the kernel of what will grow into or the seed that will grow into uh, this more robust understanding of the true self. Uh, your, your chapter 10 is entitled uh, How Francis and Merton Challenge Us to Live Today. And I think that's a good jumping off point uh, for kind of our final catch-all question, which is what, what can men learn from Thomas Merton to put into practice today? 
And, and I hope your answer is yeah. not moved to uh, a farm in Kentucky. In Kentucky. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> yeah, can you go? Can you go? You can visit that uh, yeah. monastery still, right? Mm-hmm. Thomas Burton's You absolutely monastery. can. Yeah, you don't have to stay, too. You can Good. Go. So, <laughs> Joe, let's do it. Yeah, let's go. Uh, see you later. All right. <laughs> That's right. The Abbey of Gethsemane, you know, it's, it's available. Uh, you can go and visit there uh, for a day or you can, you can make a retreat there. And they have a great guest house. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, and prayerful place to be. So I, I do recommend that. But no, you don't have to do that uh, as, as the only response. You know, I think one of the things that, that Merton challenges people, uh, you know, especially, especially, you know, young men today, it's not just about religious life. It's not just about... Um, you know, should somebody be a, a priest or, or brother or religious of some sort? Um, but rather, this idea that you were just talking about, the idea of the true self, and where do we find that? Um, the challenge of, of living the Christian life today, that subtitle you mentioned in, in Chapter 10, really comes from uh, Merton's conviction that Francis of Assisi is 100% correct when he says that to be fully human is to be a peacemaker, a reconciler, somebody who loves. And at first glance, that seems super easy, right? We're used to hearing that in the Gospels. Jesus says, love your enemies. And we go, yeah, okay, I love my enemies, but I don't have to like them. <laughs> you know, like I don't have to, you know, tolerate them. I don't have to, you know, share my, my living space or my workplace or, or my life with them. Or a radio show. And in fact, yeah, exactly. Radio show. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I think there is a truly kind of uh, counterintuitive uh, invitation there, which is, not to live according to the expectations of our society or our cultures or maybe what we grew up thinking, um, but in fact to go back to the gospel, to follow those examples that uh, Francis of Assisi models for us, uh, that Thomas Burton kind of represents in a modern language, means to uh, operate according to a different logic. And so, so I think that's probably the greatest thing he leaves us with. So in addition to reading uh, your book, which is The Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton, and your book, uh, God is Not Fair, which we plugged in the last one. So go out and get those two books to start. If we're going to dive deeper into Thomas Merton, give our listeners maybe the top three books they should go out and, and, and grab. Oh, I'm so glad you said three, because I have exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Normally people say one, and I'm like, how do I choose? Uh, so the first one is, is New Seeds of Contemplation. Uh, which is a, a book that Merton wrote. It's really about the, the spiritual life, the prayer life, uh, an introduction to contemplation and meditation. But it's there that he also talks about the true and false self. So it's okay. a great place to begin. Uh, another book is one of his later books called Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. And it's a series of uh, meditations and reflections that ask this question, what does it mean to live as a Christian in the modern world where there's structural violence, where there's discrimination, where there's injustice? Uh, it's a very powerful uh, book. And then the third, if, if people uh, still want more, I say go back to the very beginning with his The Seven Story Mountain, which is his spiritual autobiography, kind of that modern Augustine's Confessions, as it were. Yeah, perfect. Well, hey, Dan, we really appreciate uh, you jumping back on the show with us. And the, hey, Thomas Burton is so, so interesting, and there's so much information out there. So, again, we encourage you guys to go out and, and get the book, The Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton. And, again, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great joy to be with you. Awesome. Well, up next, we're going to have our 99-second homily with Father Zach, so stick around, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis with Father Zach Kautsky, and we just had a great conversation with Father Dan Haran uh, regarding the spirituality of Thomas Merton. And again, I, I, I stressed it in the, the second segment, but you know, this is a guy who— who was not a you know didn't have a relationship with God at all and became one of the uh, foremost leaders in the in the Catholic Church today uh, you know through his writing so just like Augustine no matter how far you are away from the Lord uh, the confessional's there and you can always grow closer no matter where you are in your life now for your ninety nine second homily with Father Zach very good and we really appreciate Father Dan coming on the show uh, joining us by phone from Chicago so uh, thank you Father for doing that. This is a reading from the Gospel according to John. Mary Magdalene stayed outside the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. We hear in the gospel reading today that Mary does not recognize Christ at first. She sees the the resurrection garments, the garments that have been left behind in the tomb, does not see Jesus and assumes the worst, assumes that perhaps that grave robbers came and took the body, although it seems odd because the body's gone and the fine linens are still there. And I think about that, that symbol of the, the fine linens that are left behind of Jesus. And these last 40 days of Lent, we've had really a great opportunity to to leave behind our our favorite sins, to leave behind those things that that hold us back, uh, to die to self and and to take off the old Adam and put on the new Adam or Eve. And so uh, today, as we continue through the Easter season, it might help us just to think back and say and ask the question: What is it in my life that that I'm leaving behind? What sins am I leaving behind? Uh, where am I experiencing greater freedom in my life? Where is the resurrection happening in my life? What are the, the signs of the resurrection uh, that I'm seeing happening in my own life right now as I go throughout this, this season? And so uh, today we just ask for that, uh, that, that same freedom that Mary Magdalene experienced after the resurrection, uh, the freedom that certainly in the Old Testament that Moses experienced with, with uh, the Israelites uh, when he escaped from Egypt. Uh, that Daniel uh, experienced when he was delivered from uh, the lion's den, uh, the same freedom that that Joseph experienced being freed from his brothers. We we ask for that same freedom and deliverance today. And we talked about at the beginning of Lent uh, a while back, taking Lent seriously. And I think we should renew the call to take Easter seriously. And if you made progress, spiritual progress, during Lent, you know, as like an athlete or coach, debrief, look at what happened there. What what did you do to put in place to grow closer to the Lord? And then I think one of the disservices people do is say, oh, Easter Sunday happened. I'm done. Yeah, I'm I can, done. I can yeah. do whatever I wanted again. And, you know, one of the things I found out pretty quickly was, you know, one of the things we gave up in our deal was, was uh, social media. And I said, okay, Easter Sunday, I get to try social media again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It just reaffirmed the fact that I'm not doing this anymore. You I'm didn't done. really miss it. I'm did off. You? I'm yeah. off. Yeah. So... Again, look back, do a debrief on, on your Lent, and, and just any time in your life when you've grown closer to the Lord, say, what was it that I did? And then... Make a resolution, put, and, I think. And then go forward Yeah, with make it. a resolution for, for the Easter season. Yeah, and I think, I, so I, I, again, I think we're just encouraging you to take Easter uh, seriously, uh, take this Easter ser- seriously, and this month of May, uh, you know, turn to Our Lady and ask her for, uh, for her help as well. Uh, IO Catholic Radio is a listener-supported organization, so please consider a tax-deductible donation today at iocatholicradio.com. Thank you again uh, for joining us on Man Up. On Iowa Catholic Radio, for Father Zach Kautsky, I am Joe Stopulus. It's time to man up. Man up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulus and Father Zach Kautsky. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals, Global Tech Services, and Global Aviation Resources. And by John Harada, Farm Bureau Financial Services.